All right, so any questions on any of the physio stuff? You have a good couple of days to study for Monday. No quite. You guys are all experts on the GI stuff and nephro stuff and reproductive stuff. Yeah. You will be. Okay, fantastic. That's a good. It's almost as good of an answer as we are right now. Don't be rude with your, with your names. Let's hope the power stays on for this. Oh, there you go. Fantastic. It's good to stay positive around here, you know. All right. Got two more getting in, or I uh, will go ahead and get started. You can join in if you need to. Got 26 questions here. Let's go over our Physio 3 review. All right. Pernicious anemia may result from dysfunction of which cells? Could it be the G cells, the chief cells, the mucus cells, or the parietal cells? What do we think? Pernicious anemia due to dysfunction of one of these cells. All right. Shh. And for the answers, bring it down so we can talk about it. All right, correct. The right answer in this case is parietal cells. Why is it parietal cells? It secretes intrinsic factor, which is also good for absorbing what? B12, right? If you don't know have B12, guess what? You can't uh, have a hard time making new red blood cells. You can develop the pernicious anemia that can develop there. Um, what are the G cells producing? Gastrin. Gastrin, good. What does that uh, promote? Hunger. And ghrelin promotes hunger, right? So you have the empty stomach. What do the G cells do, though? They secrete, they cause HCL secretion from the CL cells. Uh, well, so they're going to, where, where does the HCL actually come from? From the parietal cells, right? So again, you're going to have the parietal cells being activated by gastrin. But remember, um, we had those enterochromaffin-like cells as well. The gastrin will also stimulate. What does that release? Histamine. Histamine, good. Where is the histamine, uh, what type of receptor does it interact with on the parietal cells? H2, right? So you have histamine 2, so H2 receptors are located there. Good. So, um, good. Kind of know what your different cells are doing there. Um, how about the mucus cells? What do they do? Mucus. Mucus, good. And what else? So some bicarb secretion as well, because again, you want to make sure that you can neutralize the stomach acids. That uh, helps perform that, uh, that protective barrier. Um, what else can stimulate your parietal cells? What uh, neurotransmitter? Part of the parasympathetic nervous system. Acetylcholine, good. Remember, those muscarinic receptors are located there as well. They'll also have a stimulatory effect on the parietal cells and producing new HCL and then helping you to digest your food, right? Good. Um, what's coming from the chief cells? Pepsinogen, good. What helps to convert that over into the active form? HCL, good. So again, that acidic environment helps to convert that over to pepsin, and then we can start to digest some of those proteins. Good. All right. Up next. Uh, which of the following would not be a potential side effect of inhibiting the aromatase enzymes? Switching over to our reproductive stuff. Do you think hot flashes, hirsutism, vaginal dryness, or fractures? So again, usually I don't ask negative questions on my test, but for this, I kind of it's all 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 bets are off. So this will be is a negative question. So not be a potential side effect of inhibiting the aromatase enzyme. So the question is, what does the aromatase enzyme do? We shall find out. Yeah, first answer is hot flashes, not hot lashes or anything else. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Let's work through this. Let's see. Let's see what's going on here. So, what what does the aromatase enzyme do? Converts what to what? Testosterone over into 
Estrogen, right? So estradiol. Again, I use estrogen as kind of the umbrella term, but estradiol would be the predominant one that you'll see um, testosterone being converted into, right? Again, there's some other uh, interconversion happen there. There's like androgen <laughs> diol converted into, I think, I believe the estriol. Again, the, the main one is estradiol, though. So again, aromatase converts testosterone over into uh, estrogen. Good. So if we're lacking estrogen, the question is, okay, what kind of effects would we expect to see from that? Okay, so uh, having an estrogen deficiency, what would you expect to see? So what are those symptoms? Basically, the symptoms of menopause, right? So basically, you're kind of putting a patient who normally be producing estrogen, you're kind of putting them into menopause in, this, in these cases. So you expect those kind of symptoms to develop. So what would be some examples? Hirsutism. Would it be hirsutism? Vaginal dryness. It's a vaginal dryness, good. You see hot flashes, good. <laughs> Why would you see fractures? Oh, yeah, it's due to osteoporosis, right? So... Yeah. So again, I guess I probably could ask this question better than I think about it. <laughs> so again, this would be due to actually estrogen deficiencies, though. So I guess we could also say here statism would also be due to the extra androgen effects, right? But again, it's not necessarily due to the estrogen deficiencies there. So we would end up seeing that in those patients. Um, so you know what? If I could go back and redo it all again, I'd give you points for all of them. But um, again, don't worry. The free answer is still going to be uh, you know, similarly given as, as before. So, But does everyone, everyone kind of make sense with that? Everyone kind of understands? Again, I'm fallible. I make mistakes too. Had this been on a test, I would have given you would have been like, "Hey, dude, that's wrong," and I'll be like, "Okay, I'll give you points back for that, right?" Okay. I reviewed all yesterday, and I thought I had them all right, but maybe I don't. Okay, quick. A bear has run into the classroom. Which of the following are occurring? Do you have increased acetylcholine on the external urethral sphincter, causing constriction? Do you have increased acetylcholine on the detrusor muscle, causing relaxation? Do you have increased norepi on the detrusor, causing constriction? Or do you have increased norepi on the internal urethral sphincter, causing relaxation? Which of the following would occur? Tell how confident you are about the crosstalk that happens in the interim here. This one's a little tricky. Okay, so let's walk through this and see what we're talking about. So let's look at the incorrect answer. So, looking, so again, when we're saying, okay, bear runs in the room, what are we activating? Sympathetic nervous system, right? So we're activating sympathetic nervous system. So let's look at this. Okay, so increase acetylcholine on the detrusor muscle causing relaxation. What is that a, a component of? What is that part of? It's not sympathetic, so it would be part of the parasympathetic, right? Those are muscarinic receptors you're going to um, uh, be on there. And again, looking at acetylcholine on the detrusor muscle does what? Normally constricts it, right? Because you know, that's usually when you get that that uh, the urge to, to urinate. That's going to be caused by that uh, constriction of the bladder there, the detrusor muscle. So that would not be the case. That would not be what's happening here. Now, increased norepi on the detrusor causing constriction. Does norepi on the detrusor actually cause constriction? No, that's a state where you actually want to try to, to hold on to urine because again, that can help to uh, basically kind of prevent new uh, blood, uh, new urine formation, help keep blood volume up in those cases. So that would actually cause relaxation, right? And again, which receptors is that through? Beta or alpha? Remember, beta is going to be generally going to be more uh, uh, relaxing on the smooth muscle, right? So again, those are uh, actually the beta three receptors causing relaxation in those cases. Okay. Um, increased norepi on the internal urethral sphincter causing relaxation. What does norepi normally do on the internal sphincter? Constricts it because again, we want to be in a case we're actually holding on to urine in those uh, situations. So in those cases, you'd actually find uh, that it would cause constriction, not relaxation. Which receptors is that through? That is through alpha receptors, right? And again, that actually makes sense because when we talk about maybe, or this will come up and, and be important when we talk about urethral stuff later on for um, uh, in, in pharmacology, you'll actually see that one of the main treatments that we can actually use um, to help kind of manage things like uh, urinary incontinence are going to be things like anticholinergics. It's actually blood muscarinic receptors are going to cause relaxation on the, on the detrusor muscle. We're also going to look at things like um, patients who have BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. You can actually give alpha blockers and that will help, help to actually cause relaxation and allow for men to pass urine a little bit easier than they, than they did before, right? So this does come up clinically. So the question, why is this the right answer? So increased acetylcholine on the external urethral sphincter causing constriction. So again, what innervates the external urethral sphincter? 
or that pudendal nerve, right? So again, that's under somatic control. That, that's over, under our control, voluntary control. So again, that is like almost like skeletal muscle, like you would see when you're trying to bend your arm or your legs or anything like that. So that is actually acetylcholine. But the question is, what type of receptors is it interacting with? It's not muscarinic, because again, we're not activating our parasympathetic nervous system. It's going to be nicotinic, right? Remember? And we'll talk about this more when we get to you know, skeletal muscle activation later on. But again, when it's under somatic control like that, it's going to be nicotinic receptors that is activated by acetylcholine, okay? Again, that's under our control. So again, when the bear pops out, I'm not going to like pee at him to scare him away. Like that's not really a valid technique. You know, I'm going to try to hold on to my urine. And so again, that would be under voluntary control. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. But again, the big thing there is that the external urethral sphincter is under voluntary control. We can control when that opens or closes to, to a point, right? Okay. Up next, patients with liver dysfunction will have problems making what? 25 hydroxycholecalciferol, 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol, ergocalciferol, or cholecalciferol? Interesting. All right. So again, we're looking specifically, specifically what gets made in the liver. Okay. So where do we get choline and ergocalciferol from? From your diet, right? So you can get the, you can get a version of one of those from uh, from sun exposure. However, from, it's mainly we're going to get uh, be getting from your diet, or we're getting like you know nutritional supplement or vitamins or something like that. It'll either contain usually uh, D two or D three, the ergo or, or cholecalciferol. Okay, so again, those are not uh, th are those active forms of vitamin D. Those are inactive forms, again, so we can take that, we can convert, you know, real healthy individuals can make that to the active form, but you're going to find that uh, patients with significant liver disease or renal disease are not going to be able to do anything with those, right? So you can give them as much as you want, not going to do anything. So again, remember, there's a two-step process here. What's happening in the liver? Well, this is where it actually has the first hydroxylation step. So this is where you get the 25 hydroxycholecalciferol. Uh, another name for this is calcifidiol. Um, and then finally, you go to the kidneys, where it's going to make the 125 dihydroxycholecalciferol. Now, you could say by extension that if they can't make it in the liver, they don't make it in the, in the kidneys. But I think this question is really specifically targeting what's happening in the liver. Okay? That makes sense? Okay. And so you have patients with bad kidneys. Guess what? We're actually going to give them this active form. Anyone know the other name for that? Calcitriol. All right. So some people say calcitriol, I say calcitriol, it doesn't really matter, six and one half dozen of another. Okay. Up next. A patient with CHF is a dimidus. Which of the following would help to correct this issue? Would it be increases in ANP secretion, increased aldosterone secretion, increased ADH secretion, or increased renin secretion? So they are fluid overloaded. What's gonna help with that? While well, talking, you guys must feel pretty confident on this one. Let's see what the case is. All right, and you were right to be so confident because most of you got it right. Fantastic, good. Um, right, so. Patient who's a dementist, they are fluid overloaded. So chances are they have overactivity of a lot of these other uh, hormones, which is leading them to be in this state in the first place, right? So for instance, what's aldosterone going to do for us? Salt and water retention, right? ADH is going to do what? Mostly water retention, right? They're also going to become hypertensive due to that. And again, what is helping to kind of kick off that whole process of secreting more ADH and aldosterone? 
increased renal release, right? So typically you're going to find with these patients, um, due to the fact that they have, you know, poor cardiac output, it's kind of what's led to them to be in this condition anyway, where they can't really process that fluid well, typically they're going to be kind of overactive in their uh, secretion, things like ADH, renin, aldosterone, which is why we give them drugs to interrupt this whole cascade here, which is why we use things like ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, because remember angiotensin 2 is basically what renin is really kind of trying to make, and that will help to stimulate activity of aldosterone and, and ADH. On the other hand, though, what is stimulating A and P secretion? Stretch of the atria, right? Which makes sense because this patient's a demonist. They probably have a lot of uh, in diastolic volume. They probably have a lot of, uh, of preload making it back to the heart. And so, again, it's sensing that it's going to be able to secrete the AMP. And what was the AMP do at that point? Yeah, you're going to want to get rid of salt and water, right? It's kind of directly opposing the, the effects of the renal angiotensin system, right? So, again, this is the counter um, uh, to this. And so, again, this is oftentimes what you'll be measuring, measure AMP and uh, BMP levels in, in some of your CHF patients. Um, and you'll see that those levels will be pretty high based on the fact that, you know, they have all this increased atrial stretch. However, um, it may not be enough to actually deal with that, that edema, uh, all that edema. You may have to give them additional things to help kind of get rid of that fluid. Make sense? All right. Well, I felt some rumbling in the floor on that one. <laughs> All right. Uh, the majority of fluids found in semen comes from the from the vas deferens, the prostate, the seminal vesicles, or the seminiferous tubules. Interesting. Okay, so if you go back and look at that that breakdown um, uh, of the semen, you'll see that the uh, where does the, the actual sperm itself come from? Seminiferous tubules. Good. Where do they get stored at? Mm -hmm. Good. And then, so again, they're going to be traveling up through the vas deferens. Uh, they're going to go uh, pass by the seminal vesicles. Again, that's where the majority of the fluid is going to be coming from. Uh, and then, prostate does what? Just some additional secretions like zinc and calcium and things like that. But again, the majority of the, the secretions actually coming from the central vesicles itself. Okay? All right, fantastic. All right. Stimulation of the facial nerve would cause increased secretion from which salivary gland? Hmm. Sublingual, the parotid, or the submandibular? There's actually two right answers. It's a very interesting split. So the parotid is going to be innervated by what? Nine. Which is also? Glossopharyngeal, right? Good. So glossopharyngeal nerve is going to be innervating the parotid. The facial nerve is getting the submandibular and the sublingual. Um, you guys can review that slide if you need to. If you may want to. Okay. Fantastic. So again, you're going to find some questions that will just be kind of rote memorization effects like that. Other ones that might be a little bit more involved as we've seen. Again, this will be similar to a previous test uh, as you'll kind of get a feel for. Anyway, um, say patients with a vitamin A deficiency are likely to complain of diarrhea, mucositis, excessive bleeding, or impaired low light vision. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so last few people to take right to the last minute there. I think. Good, fantastic, yes. So um, go back, and again, I'm not going to ask you specifically like, which foods all these uh, different nutrients uh, come from. However, you know, if there's any like specific, like kind of obvious uh, sort of, you know, deficiency causes of this, like those are good things to note. Like, you know, if it leads to, um, you know, like what would lead to bleeding disorders? Vitamin K deficiencies, right? So again, those are things you can kind of key in on, um, uh, and those would be good to know for potential testing purposes, right? Good. But yes, low impaired low light vision, typically see, because if you don't have uh, enough vitamin A, what can you not produce? Rhodopsin, good. So you need that rhodopsin. All right. Which of the following associations is incorrect? So uh, cholecystokinin causing gallbladder contraction, gastrin causing pancreatic secretion, modulin increasing motility in uh, GIP, gastric inhibitory peptide uh, causing insulin secretion. Which one of these is incorrect? And I typically don't ask negative questions on test. Again, this is not the test. Yeah, so if you go back and look at those, um, obviously cholecystokinin is good for like sensing fat and coming into the small intestine. That's going to help to um, you know increase gallbladder contraction, kind of get those bile salts out, so that way you can start to. And you know, what do the bile salts do to fat? Emulsify it, right? It breaks it down into smaller particles, so we can absorb it a little bit easier. Good. Um, Modulin obviously causes motility, so it kind of makes sense. It's kind of right there in the name. Now, gastric inhibitory peptide. Remember, what else do you think it does? And then just stimulate insulin secretion. Yeah, basically kind of decreases out, outflow from the stomach there, which makes sense because it's gastric inhibitory peptide. But one of the other things that it does, in addition to things um, kind of similarly to other things like glucagon-like peptide, is going to help to increase insulin secretion. And that makes sense because whatever's coming out from the uh, from the stomach probably has some carbohydrates in it. We're going to want to um, start to uh, you know absorb that, and then we need to get that sugar into the cells, and insulin's going to help with that, right? However, on the other hand, uh, gastrin we know is going to be incorrect. Uh, that does not cause pancreatic secretions. More specifically, going to do what? Yeah, you see all production, it's going to work on those enterochromophin-like cells, and basically we're stimulating um, uh, gastric activity, right? All right. Uh, which of the following can enhance the gastric phase of gastric secretion? So there's three phases of that. Is it going to be stomach wall distension, stomach pH less than 2, smelling a juicy hamburger, if you're so inclined, uh, if you're a carnivore, and protein breakdown product entering the duodenum? Which one can enhance the gastric phase? <laughs> I'll tell you guys the joke. What is uh, what do you call a protein in a bad mood? Amino acid, right? <laughs> Good. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's work through this. So remember, there's three phases. What are the three phases? So the top. Sorry, at the top. It's the phallic phase, right? So again, that's when you kind of uh, smell or taste uh, the that hamburger. There, it's going to be stimulating it from the from the top down. We're good. Um, so again, that would be part of the cephalic phase. Now there's the also the gastric phase. What will stimulate the gastric phase? 
Right, it's going to be the stomach wall distension. Now, some people thought that if the stomach pH less than 2, it would also stimulate that. But does that really stimulate it? It actually inhibits it, right? Once it senses it's acidic enough, then it doesn't need to necessarily release any more HCl right at that point. And so that would actually inhibit it. If I'd said a pH greater than 2, then that probably would have actually en enhanced the secretion there. Good. Um, and then uh, there's all, what's the last phase? That's the intestinal phase. That's what basically is going to be feeding back and inhibiting the stomach from any further uh, secretion here. So again, protein breakdown products. Um, in some cases, if they're getting too much protein heading into the small intestine, that can feed back and say, hey, you know, let's go ahead and keep that uh, in, uh, secretion going to help kind of continue breaking down the proteins. Okay? All right. Activation of V2 receptors in the kidneys would lead to which of the following? Lead to reduction in serum osmolality, would it lead to hyperkalemia, hypernatremia, or excretion of dilute urine? I'm just gonna keep this going until the power runs out and then I'll <laughs> see what happens. <laughs> All right, interesting. So you got a pretty even split here amongst the answers. So let's look at that. So V2 receptors react to what? What, if, what interacts with V2 receptors? That would be vasopressin. Another name for vasopressin is? ADH, good. So, okay, so now we're looking at what are the effects of ADH? Okay, so now uh, going through this, so ADH is going to do what to our urine? It's going to dilute or concentrate it? It's going to concentrate, remember, because once we activate those V2 receptors, what gets put into the on the lumen side of the renal uh, cells? Aquaporin channels, remember, then that's going to absorb water, okay? So based on that, we know that for absorbing water from the <laughs> urine, we're going to get more concentrated urine, okay? So you see an increase in urine osmolality, but by holding on to the, all that extra water, what does it do to serum osmolality? It should decrease it, right? Because again, we're diluting what's in the blood itself. And that makes sense because what stimulates ADH release? Increase serum osmolality. Perfect, right? So again, that makes sense, right? So again, knowing what the downstream effects of these hormones are going to be is important here, right? Um, now, hypernatremia, would this occur? Why not? Because we're diluting out what's actually in the blood. And actually, if you have someone who has a, a syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, you actually run into hyponatremia is one of the more common things you see with that, okay? Uh, also, similarly, hyperkalemia would not be the case because, again, you're diluting out what's actually in the blood, okay? Make sense? Okay, so again, know if I'm increasing aldosterone activity, um, you know, what could be some of the downstream effects of that as far as like what go, what's going on in the serum? What does that do to things like blood pressure, you know, the renin system, all those kind of things is good to work through each step of the process to see what are those changes that can actually occur there, okay? All right. Uh, which of the following hormones would be considered to be primarily catabolic? Testosterone, estrogen, insulin, or cortisol? I got very quiet in here all of a sudden. I guess the ACs aren't working, I guess. That's what it feels like. So again, catabolic means what? Break down. Catabolic means we're breaking things down. Anabolic means we're building it back up. Good. So testosterone, you think about it being a 
Anabolic steroid, right? Because again, it helps to build up muscle tissue and all this kind of good stuff, right? So that's going to be anabolic. Estrogen, how about that? That's going to be anabolic too, if you think about it. So again, think about the bones, right? It's going to increase calcium uh, de deposition of the bones. It's going to be increasing growth of the endometrial uh, tissue. You know, all those things can tend to be more sort of anabolic, right? It's not really catabolic. It's not really breaking things down. How about insulin? Absolutely, that's an anabolic sort of uh, uh, hormone there, right? Because again, what does that uh, cause um, the cells to do? Take up glucose, right? And that's going to help to build them up, right? So again, people typically when you put them on insulin, what happens to their weight? They usually gain weight because they're taking all that glucose into the cells and they start to, to build up. You typically see some more adipose tissue being developed there, but primarily it's going to be more anabolic, okay? Cortisol, on the other hand, cortisol is doing what for us? Breaking things down to give us what? Give us glucose, right? Because, again, cortisol is a stress hormone. We're releasing that when we're in a state where we need that energy, presumably. So, again, you're going to be breaking down things like muscle tissue. You can potentially break down things like um, adipose tissue because it's going to give us those energy sources to start uh, to, you know, uh, give it to our muscles so we can run away from whatever that stressor happens to be or whatever happens, uh, whatever the case may be. So, again, primarily going to think more of cortisol as being a catabolic sort of hormone. Now, again, do people gain weight when you put them on cortisol? Yes, but that's going to be related to some other kind of downstream effects, things like fluid retention, and some of going to be related to um, the hyperglycemia being eventually that glucose has to be stored somewhere. Typically, this means more in the adipose tissue, but primarily, especially like the muscle wasting sort of effects, you think of cortisol as being more of a catabolic sort of hormone. Okay? Make sense? Okay. Uh, which of the following pairings is incorrect? So the pyloric sphincter between the stomach and the duodenum, the lower esophageal sphincter being between the esophagus and the stomach, the ileocecal valve between the appendix and the colon, or the upper esophageal sphincter between the pharynx and the esophagus. A little bit of anatomy here. Good job. All right. Yes. So where does the ileocecal valve, where does that connect? The ileum to the cecum. Perfect. So good. So yeah, so to the colon. So that makes perfect sense based on the name, right? So it's nice to kind of tell you that right in the name. Um, yeah, so the pyloric sphincter is going to be from the stomach to the duodenum. That makes sense. Again, you can have issues there where um, maybe, for instance, you have, say, something blocking outflow from the stomach into the small intestine, right? So what did you call that? Like a pyloric stenosis, right? So if you had that um, uh, kind of preventing flow from the stomach to the small intestine, that could be a thing. Uh, what happens to say like the lower esophageal sphincter isn't working correctly? Reflux. Yeah, you have like acid reflux. So again, it's kind of good to know, like based on like the symptoms the patient is experiencing, like what does that kind of correlate to as far as what what is uh, dysfunctional in those cases, right? Okay. All right. Increased activity of five alpha reductase would lead to which of the following effects? Decreased libido, gynecomastia, impotence, or prostate enlargement? I think. Should be fresh in your mind. We just went over yesterday, right? Fantastic. And we're looking at increased activity of 5 alpha reductase. Obviously, you need to know what 5-alpha reductase does to know what is going to happen here. Or interesting, okay. So, what does 5 alpha reductase do? Converts testosterone to DHT. Yeah, uh, so it converts testosterone to DHT. And remember, which one has more potent androgenic effects? DHT, good. So, if I give something that blocks the effect of 5 alpha reductase, 
I can block the effects of DHT essentially, right? So again, some of those effects you're going to see from blocking that potentially. Say if you had something like um, you know BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia, I can give the patient something that actually blocks that enzyme, and that way they have less DHT activity. But some of the things they may manifest with are going to be signs of say low testosterone activity, or low androgenic activity, which can be things like decreased libido, can be things like impotence. Remember we talked about um, with erections, there's kind of four main components there. This affects the testosterone component of it, right? So that could be one thing you might see with that. What is gynecomastia? Yeah, like male breast tissue development, uh, primarily, again, we're talking about male patients for this question. Um, but again, that can be seen because if you lower the testosterone activity, you tend to increase more of the estrogenic sort of activity. So that could be one thing you see with that. However, with increased activity of this enzyme, I'm producing too much DHT. And so you expect to see things like muscle growth. You expect to see things like uh, maybe increased libido, um, issues of impotence probably, at least from that standpoint. However, prostatic enlargement is going to be the other big problem, right? So again, you find that in a lot of um, older gentlemen, they're going to have this continued growth of the prostate. Some of it may be due to DHT being in um, uh, sort of an upregulated sort of state. Okay. All right. Up next. Uh, which of the following would be true in a female patient taking oral hormonal contraceptives? Would progesterone production be increased? Would FSH levels be inhibited? Would GNRH levels remain elevated? Or corpus luteum secretion being elevated? What do you think would happen? Okay, so let's go through this. All right, so again, someone's taking oral contraceptives. Typically, it's based uh, on estrogen and also progestin, right? You have to have both of those there because otherwise, if you just had estrogen, um, you know, overstimulation of those tissues, you can actually develop things like endometrial cancer. You don't, you don't want to typically cause that in your patients, right? So you're using a combination of the two, okay? So in this case, would GNRH levels be elevated? It's not the right answer, so no, but why not? Remember? negative feedback loops, right? It's going to feed back from the hypothalamus and say, hey, we have enough estrogen and progestin here. We don't need to increase levels of GNRH. Now, remember early on, during right before you have actual ovulation occur, there's a period where you actually have um, those increased levels of estrogen can actually stimulate things like GNRH release, so that way you have increased LH levels, right? That's the LH surge that leads directly into ovulation. However, when you have both of these levels being high, you typically see GNRH being um, uh, shut down, right? Kind of do that negative feedback loop. So that would not be the case here. Um, looking at progesterone production being increased, would this occur? What actually produces the progestin primarily? It's a corpus luteum. How do we get the corpus luteum? To have a follicle develop, and then you get that graphene follicle, and then you ovulate, and then you develop that corpus luteum, right? So it's left over that follicle. Well, in this case, if I'm inhibiting this whole process, the patient's never ovulating. They never have that follicle. Do they ever get a corpus luteum? No, so they're not really going to be producing a whole lot of progestin in these cases because, again, we're giving them excess or endo uh, exogenous progestin. That's actually going to be decreasing that activity there. Good. So, again, both of these would be incorrect um, because, again, they have no corpus luteum actually being developed in the first place. However, FSH levels would remain low because, again, of that negative feedback loop inhibiting FSH and then additionally LH would be inhibited as well. Okay. All right. What does inhibit normally inhibit? LH or FSH? FSH? FSH, yeah. I remember because, again, when you have um, you have several of those follicles that are starting to develop, you're going to find one of them is going to kind of take the lead and then release that inhibit, and that will kind of uh, prevent the other one from uh, taking over, essentially. Right? So you just have the one that's going to be developed and then eventually ovulate. Okay. All right, this test, and I'll show you a picture in, in a second, is looking for the presence of progesterone, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, HCG, or inhibin. This is one of the either best results you're ever going to see or one of the worst results you're ever going to see, depending on your situation.
Good. This is looking for HCG, right? Because who's producing HCG? Pregnant women, right? Because what's producing that HCG itself? And that blastus is going to implant in the uterus. We're going to start developing that HCG production, right? Because again, that's going to help to make sure that um, we prevent things like, um, you know, that corpus luteum being uh, staying there, so that way you're producing estrogen and progesterone. That, that way, you make sure the patient doesn't try to ovulate again. Because again, that baby's like, hey, I'm here. Let's go ahead and keep me developing and prevent anything else from developing in the meantime, right? So, why is there two lines? One's a control line, right? So again, when you're doing one of these tests, it's a good education for patients if they're maybe are, are uh, not used to taking these. Um, you're going to find that this one control line is going to be always, that should always be there. If you don't see that control line, the test is no good, right? Because again, that should always be there. It should always be positive in those cases, right? Because um, basically what's happening is the patient is peeing on one end of the stick, and you're going to find that it's going to be traveling up via diffusion. And again, everything should be, uh, the control line should always come up. And then if there is HCG present, it's going to then uh, interact with this, uh, this line right here. And then this will show up if they actually have have HCG present. Now, again, could they have very low levels and they're just too early? Absolutely. Once there's a certain concentration, then it should be able to trip positive and that way you know you're pregnant. Okay. And again, does it matter the uh, how dark this line is? No, the presence of any line is automatically positive. It does not matter how dark or, or, or light that line is. Uh, I can tell you from my experience, you know, the first baby, of course, you're trying every single month and every month, pee on the stick, and it's like, is it positive? I can't quite tell. Is there, is there a line? Is there not a line? And then the second one, then we weren't trying at all, it was as dark as could be. <laughs> I was like, well, shoot, that thing is positive. And this is from the dollar store. So, you know, it's right. It, it's no good. Yeah. <laughs> you ever need a quick uh, pregnancy test? Go to the dollar store. They probably have one on the shelf. And yeah. Anyway. I'm from, I, we live in St. Cloud, so, you know, we got to live a St. Cloud lifestyle, but. <laughs> All right. Uh, which of the following is used to digest proteins in the GI tract? Chymotrypsin, gastrin, amylase, or trypsin inhibitor? Interesting. So does gastrin cause any digestion of proteins? No, it does stimulate the digestion of proteins, right? It's going to stimulate things like, you know, the HCL production is going to convert pepsinogen into pepsin. Now, does pepsin cleave proteins? Absolutely, right? So gastrin would not be correctly uh, here to directly use. We don't use that to digest proteins. However, how about amylase? What does that digest? Yeah, starches, carbohydrates, right? So that would not be good for proteins. Trypsin inhibitor, you might imagine, would just do what? Inhibit trypsin, it would inhibit the activity of uh, actually digesting proteins. Good. But chymotrypsin certainly is one, right? Where does this come from? From the pancreas, right? So again, there's a variety of different proteases that will be sent out from the uh, from the pancreas. This is one of them, right? So trypsin is another one, chymotrypsin. There's several varieties. Um, but again, being able to kind of recognize like what they're used for broadly is, is, is a good thing there. Um, however, is that the one used in the, in the stomach itself? No. no, we're using what there? Pepsin, right? So again, there's some varieties that we're going to see. And again, remember that some of these are working at different pHs, uh, uh, you know, most nominally. So for instance, um, in the stomach, pH is very low. Pepsin works very great in, in a low pH. However, things like trypsin, chymotrypsin work better at a more neutral pH, which is why it works better in the small intestine, right? Okay. Up next. A uh, patient has a blood pressure of 190 over 110 millimeters of mercury, which would occur due to autoregulation in the kidneys. We have efferent arterial constriction, afferent arterial constriction, afferent arterial dilation, or efferent arterial dilation. Hmm. So high blood pressure, low blood pressure. Some of you may have this blood pressure right before a test. Hopefully you recognize this as high, perhaps. Thank <laughs> you. 
Mm, okay, so remember this is auto regulation. What does auto regulation do for us? It wants so it wants to keep blood flow to the kidneys pretty regular, right? You want to make sure that if blood pressure gets low, we can increase blood flow to the kidneys. If pressure gets high, we can limit that, that pressure getting to the kidneys. Because again, the glomerulus is pretty sensitive. It only wants to really work within a certain tight range of blood pressures there, or certain uh, tight range of pressures. Um, and so you can change that pretty drastically by changing which arterial predominantly. Because again, what's going to be coming in? The afferent arterial is coming in. The pressure leaving is going to be efferent arterial, which again, you're going to find that. I'll talk about that in a second. But so imagine this patient's blood pressure high or low high right so that's a high blood pressure so again the kidneys do they want to have all that pressure hitting the glomerulus no. no they want to try to limit that as best they can so how are they going to do that they're going to constrict what the pressure is coming in they're going to try to limit that pressure coming in and they're constricting the afferent arterial right so again that's what's coming into the glomerulus they're going to be constricting the afferent arterial now if i said their blood pressure was say you know uh, 60 over 30 what would be happening you'd have afferent arterial dilation, right? Because you get what you want, as much pressure coming in there as possible. Now, in those cases where you have uh, low pressure coming into the glomerulus, what do you think the efferent arterial wants to do to try to pick up that pressure? It would cause constriction of the efferent arterial. Remember what hormone causes constriction of the efferent arterial? Angiotensin II is a big one, right? So again, that's, uh, we'll talk about that when we get to farm, but angiotensin II is a big constrictor of the efferent arterial, okay? What causes uh, dilation of the afferent arterial? Prostaglandins are a big thing, yeah. causes uh, dilation there. What causes constriction? Or can cause constriction? Now, there's norepi, but remember, norepi is going to be doing that from an external sort of regulation, right? So when we talk about intrinsic versus external or extrinsic, uh, internal is that auto regulation where the kidneys are directly controlling it versus the external, so it's going to be more like the sympathetic nervous system. Before I ask a question, but it's just like in my head, like when you conserve the tube, it's more pressure. So, like, I guess I thought it was dilation because you're trying to reduce the pressure. Mm -hmm. So imagine, um, let me see here, paint. Let's do some drawing, and I'll show you what I mean. All right, so imagine we have the glomerulus right here. This is going to be not great. Okay. Again, this will be on video, so you can always uh, go back and show your kids this. And... Okay, so let's say blood's heading this direction, right? Oops. That's an arrow. Okay. <laughs> Laugh at my drawing, okay? Self-conscious as it is. Um, right, so imagine the pressure is very high on this end right here, right? So again, the pressure is very high coming in. So we want to limit that. So again, by causing a constriction of this, basically you're trying to limit how much actual pressure comes in. So again, by putting a, a pinch on that, essentially, the pressure here on the glomerulus is actually going to go down at that point, right? So by squeezing that down, you're going to be preventing all that pressure that's really high on this end here from actually making it to the glomerulus. Versus if the pressure is very low on this end, we want to have as much of that coming in as possible to try to keep that hydrostatic pressure up because that's what's going to drive the actual filtration to occur. In that case, you're actually going to find dilation of that afferent arterial. Okay. Remember, similarly, we we're talking about cerebrovascular uh, autoregulation. Similarly, if you find that if you have a very high blood pressure, what do the cerebral vessels want to do? They want to constrict because they want to keep pressure in those cerebral vessels at a pretty set rate, just like the kidneys do. Uh, if you were to have low blood pressure, what happens? They tend to dilate, right? Because, again, they want to have as much pressure of that coming in to make sure you're perfusing the brain appropriately. Make sense? Yes, sir? Um, you will find that, yes, it can sometimes work in concert in that case. So, again, if you had low blood pressure, you'd have the afferent being dilated, the efferent would constrict, and that would help to regulate the, uh, the GFR pressure, the hydrostatic pressure within the glomerulus itself. Okay. Um, you may find in some cases that the pressure is still too high on the afferent coming in. You may have a little bit of dilation of the efferent, but that doesn't really deal with the baseline problem of the fact they have way too much pressure coming into the glomerulus. That makes sense. Okay. All righty. Next up. Uh, inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis would have which effect on GI function? Would it increase production of the mucus barrier? Would it increase gastrin secretion, increase HCL secretion, or increase peristalsis? So if I'm inhibiting prostaglandin synthesis, what effects is it going to have on GI function?
Anyone know how I could inhibit uh, prostaglandin synthesis? <coughs> Give them aspirin, naproxen, ibuprofen, and an NSAID this is going to definitely have a big effect there. Right, okay, so if I have decreased prostaglandin synthesis, okay, so say for instance, I give someone like Advil or something, um, you're going to find that uh, what effect does it have on the GI barrier? It's going to decrease its activity, right? That's why you see so many peptic ulcers that come about from people taking an Advil uh, around the clock uh, for a long period of time, right? So again, typically prostaglandins are stimulatory on that gastric barrier. You would lose that and have an issue. And again, prostaglandins are typically going to be inhibitory, uh, ultimately on that proton pump, right? So if I'm inhibiting the production of prostaglandins, that inhibitory effect is now taken away, and now I can have more HCL production. So again, now if I inhibit that prostaglandin synthesis, I'm going to have a decreased barrier and more HCL production. Guess what? And then you have that uh, digestion of the stomach, basically, and have uh, eventual you know, ulcers and bleeding, all kinds of other things that can develop there, right? Okay. doesn't really have a good effect on um, gastric secretion directly. It doesn't really have a good effect on, on peristalsis. Really just HCL production is the main thing you see with that. Yes, ma'am. I have a question, but it's from the last question. Okay. So, um, Too late. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> um, one of the answers was like to, well, the answer was constrict afferent, but then one of the answers was like dilate Yeah. Is You basically you're going to find that uh, the efferent is really kind of controlling. Like once the pressure, uh, that pressure is made it to the glomerulus, that's where you're going to find where the efferent is really going to take over and kind of control that, right? It's going to try to dilate the pressure too high in the glomerulus, or if it's too low, it'll try to constrict. That's a minor effect compared to, uh, in, that, in that case, where you had a really hypertensive patient, like that's kind of a minor effect compared to what, how we can control the afferent. Because again, that's kind of the gatekeeper for the pressure making it to the glomerulus in the first place. Yeah, so you may have a little bit of dilation, but that's not going to be the main thing the kidneys are doing to auto regulate itself. Yeah. Okay. Okay, up next, which area of the kidney would have the most concentrated filtrate? Would it be the thin ascending loop of Henle? Would it be the distal convoluted tubule, the cortical collecting duct, or the proximal convoluted tubule? The most concentrated filtrate. All right, so let's let's work through this. Let's find, figure out what that is. I'm gonna I'm gonna do some more drawing just because you guys like the first one so much. <laughs> let's don't save that. We don't want to save that. Okay, so let's imagine we have the glomerulus here, right? We're gonna have our proximal convoluted tubules. Gonna go down to our descending loop of Henle, of our ascending loop of Henle, of our distal convoluted tubule, and then finally our collecting duct, right? So again, let me do the other side. Go down. And then it's going to kind of bulge out when you have the thick ascending loop. And then it's going to collect here, right? And then so let's imagine we have urine going through, filtrate, and out, right? Okay. That's for my own benefit more than anything else. But let's look at what's actually happening. Okay, so what happens when you filter here? Remember what's happening in the proximal convoluted tubule? Bunch of stuff's being reabsorbed, right? So you're primarily having a lot of water being reabsorbed. You have a lot of sodium being reabsorbed. What else? Glucose, right? Glucose gets reabsorbed there. What else? Amino acids, you're going to have some bicarb. A lot of things are getting reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Now remember that sodium and water are going to be reabsorbed at roughly the same proportion in the proximal convoluted tubule. So again, serum osmolarity is usually kept around where? 300. Good. So it's going to be 300 roughly here in the glomerulus. When it gets filtered out and then gets reabsorbed, it's roughly going to be what right here? Sodium and water being reabsorbed in the same proportion, you expect it to be? The same is going to be the same. So again, because sodium and water are going at a similar ratio, the uh, the actual osmolarity doesn't really change much from the blood as it would to the actual filtrate itself. Right here, the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, good. So what's happening once we get to the uh, descending loop of Henle? Good. So let's say we're going to do a blue line. We're going to say water's leaving, right? Water's coming out. Good. So what's happening to the concentration as we go down? It's 
increasing the concentration, right? Because remember, we're having water leaving. And then once we get to the uh, thick ascending loop, what's happening here? All right, remember, this is going to be impervious to water. And we're going to have, let's use uh, red for our sodium. We're going to see sodium coming out predominantly, right? That was a terrible arrow, but that's okay, right? <laughs> so sodium is coming out. Good. Remember that countercurrent multiplier? That was basically what's helping us to make sure we're reabsorbing all those ions in the thick ascending loop. That's going to help us to drive this concentration down here in the uh, the loop of Henle that much higher, right? And again, the further down this projects into the, the medulla of the kidney, the more concentrated it gets. Anyone remember the max osmolarity we can get? Probably 1,200 milliosms per liter, right? So again, 12, 1,200 is roughly the most concentrated we get here. As you start to get into the thick ascending loop, we're losing those ions. What happens to the concentration? The osmolarity. It's going to decrease, right? Because we're losing those ions. That water is staying there because this is impermeable to water. And then by the time you get to the distal convoluted tubule, what's the osmolarity? It's pretty low, right? Or actually, it gets lower than what it would be in the blood. It gets into like around 100 or so, right? Um, so this is what's good because we like to be able to maintain that dilute urine. So that way, if we have too much volume on board, we have too much fluid, we can get rid of dilute urine to get more uh, rid of more water than solute, and then we can help to maintain that fluid balance, right? Because again, the cor the collecting duct here, and again, the cortical collecting duct is really here at the top, and this is going to be very similar to what you see with the um, uh, the distal convoluted tubule, right? So you can kind of consider these pretty similar as far as uh, the osmolarity goes. However, in the collecting duct, is this normally um, uh, permeable to water? Not normally, right? Unless you have what hormone around? ADH. You have to have ADH around for this to be uh, to be permeable to water. So in these cases there, so this is already dilute coming into the distal convoluted tubule. You're going to have um, reabsorption of some solutes. You're still losing salt. You're still having some uh, solutes being reabsorbed here. That makes it so that you can get the urine as dilute as possible. And what's the the, the max dilution or the, the least um, uh, concentrated uh, urine you can make? Uh, lowest osmolarity, I should say. Like 50 milliosms per liter. That's the most dilute you can make it. However, if I want to make it more concentrated, say for instance, I want to hold on to some of that water, that's when you're going to have those aquaporin channels getting placed, right? And then that water can be reabsorbed. And this is all due to the effect of arginine vasopressin or ADH. Okay, make sense? So again, most concentrated is going to be here in uh, the uh, the distal portion of the convoluted tubule. I'm sorry, the uh, distal portion of the loop of Henle here at the bottom, right before you get to uh, the thick ascending loop, right? So thin ascending would be roughly the most concentrated of that list. Okay. So go back and review that. There's a good slide that kind of shows you the numbers as it goes through, and that will kind of help you parse out that. All right. Up next, increases in serum calcium would cause which of the following? <coughs> increased calcitonin release, increased vitamin D synthesis, increased osteoclast activity, or increased PTH release? Good. Most of you got that one correct, right? So again, hypercalcemia should stimulate release of calcitonin. What does calcitonin do for me? It's going to increase activity of osteoblast. You'd be inhibiting the osteoclast. What does it do, say, in the GI tract? Let's see, decreased absorption of calcium. What does it do in the kidneys? Decreases reabsorption of calcium, so you actually excrete more calcium, right, because the calcium levels are too high at, uh, uh, in this case. Um, now, what would stimulate vitamin D synthesis? Parathyroid hormone is going to be uh, stimulating that, right? So, again, parathyroid is uh, going to release its hormone when what happens? Mm -hmm. You have hypocalcemia, so it releases PTH. It's going to increase the amount of uh, calcium being reabsorb or absorbed from the GI tract. You're going to be increasing the reabsorption from the kidneys. You're also going to increase vitamin D synthesis, right? In addition, what does it do to the osteoclast, PTH? Stimulates activity because you want to be kind of breaking down that bone so that way you can get those levels up. Okay. All right. Uh, blocking angiotensin II receptors would cause which of the following? We have increased arterial arterial pressure, decreased GFR, increased potassium excretion, or increased salt retention. So I'm blocking angiotensin two receptors.
And what binds to angiotensin II receptors? Angiotensin II. So what is that? Okay, so we block those effects. What are we going to see? Interesting. Okay. So let's work through this step by step. Okay. So angiotensin II typically does what to blood pressure? Yeah. Angiotensin II increases blood pressure, right? That's being released when the kidneys are sensing, hey, you know, we, we release renin because we're not getting enough blood flow. We're not having enough volume and salt here. That's when you get renin being released. Renin eventually leads to angiotensin II production, as we know, right? So typically, if you have less angiotensin II activity, you see decreases in blood pressure. This is why we use these drugs as a antihypertensive, right? By blocking those receptors. Now, uh, increased potassium excretion. Why would this not be the case? What stimulates potassium excretion? Aldosterone, right? So if I'm inhibiting angiotensin II, guess what? It also inhibits the release of aldosterone. So less aldosterone means I'm going to be uh, uh, keeping more potassium, and then it wouldn't cause increased salt retention and be actually getting rid of more salt. Okay? And again, usually people are hypertensive. What's their salt intake like? Usually pretty high, right? Usually they're going to be taking a lot of salt and they can hold on to a lot of water. It helps increase that pressure there. Good. Um, and that makes sense because actually when I give patients these drugs, guess what happens to their potassium level? It goes up because, again, I'm, I'm inhibiting that aldosterone effect. So, again, it's a very um, obvious thing you can check. You can start a patient. You have their uh, initial Chem 7. You check it then. You check, give them uh, angiotensin receptor blocker. Then you check it afterwards. Guess what? Potassium is going to go up. And that can be pretty bad if you give it to someone who has poor kidney function. Their potassium is already high to begin with. You can cause an arrhythmia and cause someone, uh, someone to die from that. That's why you got to be really careful in monitoring things like electrolytes. Um, now, why would it cause a decrease in GFR? Not necessarily to decrease blood pressure, because again, if we decrease blood pressure within reason, the kidneys can auto-regulate, so that's not an issue. But what does angiotensin II directly affect in the kidneys? The afferent or the efferent arterial? Efferent arterial, good. Does it cause it to constrict or relax? Cause it to constrict, right, which increases pressure, which increases GFR, right? So if I block that effect, guess what? Now that efferent arterial is going to dilate. That decreases the pressure in the glomerulus, and what does that do to GFR? It goes down, right? So that's, why, again, why if you have patients who have poor kidney function, if I give them one of these drugs, if I give them the, like a full full course dose uh, without kind of gently titrating them up, you're going to find that you will cause an acute kidney uh, injury. You can cause acute kidney uh, decrease in function for those patients because they're so reliant on that angiotensin II to cause that constriction of the efferent arterial, Okay. Again, that's one of the big things to be careful of when you're using things that are affecting the angiotensin system. Um, again, the general rule of thumb is with a lot of patients, start low and go slow, especially the older ones who don't have a whole lot of hemo uh, homeostatic reserve, as the case may be, right, or hemodynamic reserve. Um, okay, so that makes sense? Why would decrease GFR? Okay, so remember, the renal angiotensin system is complicated. There's several steps along the way, but if I interrupt one portion of the process, what are the downstream effects? What happens to things like ADH, to aldosterone, to all these other um, steps along the way, okay? Yes. But so that doesn't affect it as much as the Yeah, angiotensin II is specifically on the efferent arterial, right? Because <laughs> again, when when is renin being released? When the, when the when remember the the macula densa and the and the distal convoluted tubule is, is detecting there's not enough blood flow here. There's not enough salt. There's not enough water here. So I'm trying to increase the amount of kidney blood flow. The amount of uh, uh, filtration is happening. So it does that by causing angiotensin II to be produced, and that constricts that efferent arterial, which is increasing that hydrostatic pressure. Increases the filtration that actually occurs there, right? Okay. So you can walk through that whole process. Again, it's good to know this because this is going to be paramount to know when you're treating patients with hypertension or coronary artery disease or previous MI or CHF. It's going to, it's going to come up time and time again for these patients. Okay. Okay. A uh, female patient has a pituitary resection. Which of the following would occur? So she's we've gotten rid of the pituitary gland. Would we have increased GnRH production, increased estrogen production, increased FSH production, or increased LH secretion? It's just a production there, but whatever.
kidding. <laughs> oh, we're almost done. We only have a couple more questions. I know we're talking about the kidneys so much, everyone's got to go to the bathroom, but we're almost done. All right, good. Yes, so why would they have increased GNRH production? There's no feedback, right? There's no uh, there's no feedback loop that happens there. So again, we've got, cut out the pituitary gland. So basically, they don't have the ability to produce LH and FSH, right? And then they can't produce that. Can they produce estrogen? Not really, right? So you really wouldn't have any estrogen to feed back and actually inhibit that production of GNRH in that case. So again, this would be one of those cases where you have high GNRH, but really nothing to feed back and prevent it from being released. Okay? That makes sense. All right. Uh, what's the name of this creature? Hmm. Is it a sarlacc, a wookie, a gungan, or a womp rat? Hmm. Yeah, it's for no points. It's only 20 seconds. I like the collective groan that I heard, though. I was like, oh, it's Star Wars stuff. <laughs> yes, it is a sarlacc pit. It ate Boba Fett. Nope. Anyone said a Wookiee? Come on. Come on, really? Jeez. Okay. Uh, second to last question. Which of the following lipoproteins contains the largest amount of triglycerides? Is it our LDLs, or VLDLs, or IDLs, or HDLs? So going back to liver function, talking about production of cholesterol and all that. What is the highest amount of triglycerides? She needs something to drop her. Drop her paper. Pick up your letter, jeez. No. Okay, um, right. Yeah, so the general flow of things, right, so you start out with these chylomicrons that are going to be within the liver, and then as it gets transported out, you start out with the VLDL, which stands for what? Very low density lipoproteins. They'll eventually turn into IDLs, which are the intermediate density lipoproteins. That's when it's losing triglycerides. So again, we're donating to things like, you know, producing cell <laughs> membranes or producing, uh, producing new hormones or things like that. Uh, it's going to turn to those IDLs, the inter intermediate density lipoproteins. The cholesterol content is going to be what's increasing here as far as the, the ratio goes. So losing tri triglycerides. Uh, IDLs turn into LDLs. So again, those are going to be more predominantly cholesterol than they are triglycerides. And then finally, we'll have HDL. And HDLs help with what? They're gonna be, yeah, they're going to be cardiac protectors. They're picking up all those extra uh, things like cholesterol and triglycerides, trying to take them back to the liver for eventual um, expulsion, right, or excretion from the body. So, um, again, when you're measuring things like you measure like a lipid panel on a patient, you measure LDL. That's pretty self-explanatory. You're actually measuring the, the LDL directly. HDL is going to be one of those things you measure, but you're also going to measure triglycerides. And triglycerides is basically going to be sort of an indirect measure of your VLDL and to some degree your IDLs, but predominantly the, the VLDL is the thing you're measuring there. Okay, because again, they have the highest triglyceride content of the group here. Okay, final question. Which of the following are responsible for amino acid reabsorption in the kidney? Uh, counter transport, aqueous diffusion, secondary active transport, osmosis. Oh, so the amino acid reabsorption in the kidneys. All right, so this, yes, yeah, secondary active transport. What do I mean by secondary active transport? Shh. 
So it means it does not directly require energy to occur, right? So if you remember looking back to those uh, pictures of the renal cells, and again, primarily looking at the proximal convoluted tubule, remember the sodium <laughs> potassium pump requires energy, right? It's going to be shuttling sodium out of the cell, causing the intracellular concentration to become very low, and then that's going to drive that passive diffusion through that facilitated transport, basically, of the co-transporters, right? So sodium and amino acid co-transport. You have to have both there to go through that transporter to get into the cell. And again, at that point, it's going along the concentration gradient because the sodium levels in the cell is so low. So we call it secondary <laughs> active transport. It's only possible because of the activity of an active transport with the sodium potassium pump, but it's being driven by that low sodium concentration in the cell, driving that sodium and amino acid in, right? Any other examples of that? Let's say sodium and something else? Sodium and glucose is the other big one, right? That's the other big thing happening in the proximal convoluted tubule, right? Okay. So let's look at our winners. Uh, FK, I'm going to assume that stands for fun kid. Who's that? Oh, there you go. Fantastic. <laughs> I was assuming it was something else uh, for a second. Uh, Culture Chiari. Fantastic. Good job. And then T-Pain. I didn't know we had a rapper here. Good job. Fantastic. Your answer is onomatopoeia. I'm just kidding. It's uh, D. Let's go D. All right, thank you. Any questions before you go? No, all right. Good luck studying.